All right, so what I'm going to show you now is how to actually derive the point, the, uh, the point response function um, for a multi-layer system. So what I'm going to do, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and solve the diffusion equation analytically inside each individual layer, and then I'm going to try and patch together the different layers using boundary conditions. Um, so, so here it goes. It turns out that like, I really only have to solve the diffusion equation one time because the form of the solution will be the same for every one of the layers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the heat transfer equation for each layer. Actually, let me get a pen out here. For each layer. So the, the layer I'm going to denote N. And so all of these subscript ends that appear here um, refer to which layer I'm in. But it really has the same form for each layer, so it doesn't matter so much. Um, so what I'm going to do is write that out. So this is the diffusion equation. So I have the heat capacity times a transient term equals essentially the Laplacian of um, you know the, the temperature. The only thing that I've done here that's a little bit unusual is that I tried to separately write the thermal conductivity in the in-plane and the through-plane direction. So remember um, that I'm trying to work in cylindrical coordinates. So in cylindrical coordinates, the maximum anisotropy I can handle would be an in-plane thermal conductivity in the radial direction and a through-plane thermal conductivity in the Z direction. Um, in fact, you'll see that the notation here is a little bit bad. And I think in the next equation, I'll switch to calling these lambda instead of K. And um, you'll see why. Basically, when we go to take Hankel transforms, there's going to be another variable k around. So I don't want to use that for the thermal conductivity. Um, so, you know, basically, if I if I take the oh one one other uh, word of warning here is that if I write heat, some people may be turned off by the way I've written this because the heat capacity or the specific heat capacity in heat written here would be volumetric heat capacity. Um, not the constant volume heat capacity, but a volumetric heat capacity, um, which means that the units would be um, joules per meter cubed Kelvin. Okay, so just a word of warning. So if you have it in mass-based units, you'll have to multiply by the density. Okay, so all I'm gonna do from, the, from there is I'm gonna first take the Fourier transform and then I'll take the Henkel transform of that equation. Um, so it turns out that when you take the Fourier transform of a time derivative, all it does is pop out a factor of I minus I omega every time you see the, the derivative. So the, the D temperature D time becomes minus I omega um, times the Fourier transform of the temperature. And since the other things don't have any time derivatives, the Fourier transform just sort of pops inside all of the space derivatives. Um, then I'm going to take the Henkel transform in space. And um, it turns out that the Henkel transform, um, when you have something that looks like the, um, the, the Laplacian in the, in the R direction, pops out a factor of um, 4 pi squared k squared. This just comes from basic, this is actually part of why the Henkel transform is defined the way it is. It has this nice property when applied to um, the Laplacian. Okay, anyway, so what's cool is that basically the time derivative and the space derivative, at least in the R direction, those things got converted into just multiplication of like a prefactor rather than having derivatives around. So now instead of having to solve for temperature as a function of time, radius, and z, now all I have to do is solve for temperature as a function of z, right? Isn't that cool? Um, that's, that's part of the reason why you do it this way. Um, so um, I can rearrange all that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange everything so that, you know, basically I'm going to collect terms that just have to do with the temperature and separately can, um, you know, collect terms that just have to do with Z. Um, and if I rearrange in that way, I'll get something that involves the second derivative um, plus a bunch of stuff that acts as a prefactor um, for the no derivative version of the temperature. Um, and that equals zero. And what's cool about that is that has an analytic solution as a function of z, um, which I'll write in the next slide. Um, but for the moment, let me just simplify that and uh, one step further and just put it, I'll put the simplified expression in the box here. So the second derivative of temperature, at least in the z direction, um, minus some constant prefactor times uh, the temperature equals zero. That defines a second order ordinary differential equation that I can solve for 
the T hat hat, which was the Fourier and Hankel transform of temperature. Um, I can define, like to make this thing look a little bit simpler, I can define two um, sort of side variables. One that I'll call um, Q squared, which is basically, um, basically just describes the penetration depth. If you look at what this thing is, this will describe what's called the penetration depth um, squared and then, or one over the penetration depth squared, and the other thing I'll define as eta, um, which is just the anisotropic ratio. So the ratio of in-plane to through-plane thermal conductivity. So this thing is what I'm gonna focus on now. Um, this thing has an analytic solution that I can write um, quite easily.